although it doesn't quite fit with today's readings, I feel that I should begin with my personal good news. I am so happy to be here. I am honored, humbled, and grateful. Since I first came to this parish as a deacon in the last century, 1998, it has represented for me an ideal place to be a priest. Of course, the parish has changed a lot over the years. Well, really, it's the parishioners that have changed. There are some familiar faces from my past, but there are many, many, many more new faces. However, while the faces have multiplied, the parish has remained the same. Faith-filled people striving to live out their faith in a challenging world by energizing one another to serve and to care through the promotion of justice. So thank you for welcoming me into your midst. Now what about that storm at sea? At the time of Job and Jesus, the sea was often seen as a place of chaos, a place that only God could control and tame. When one is on a boat or a ship at sea, even if the ship looked quite big in the harbor, it feels awfully small out in the ocean. And anyone who looks up or out has got to feel pretty insignificant. When I have had that experience, my mind has naturally been drawn to the enormity of the created universe and the grandeur and the power of God. And the enormity and the grandeur are magnified in the midst of a storm. And along with the magnification, fear can well up. In our first reading from the book of Job, Job has been locked in a debate with some of his so-called friends about why he has been at the center of so much suffering. In the passage we heard today, the writer is seeking to channel what he imagines would be part of God's response. In drawing Job's attention to the immensity of the ocean, Job is being reminded of his place in the universe. Life is like the ocean, and like the ocean, only God can control life. Thus, Job, lacking the perspective of God, is in no position to question the ultimate reality, the ultimate reason for why things happen. I wouldn't be surprised if you find this simplistic framing of the resolution inadequate. So I encourage you to read the remainder of the book of Job. Besides being quite beautiful and poetic, one sees that Job comes to the conclusion that it wasn't an explanation that he really needed, but faith. Faith that in the midst of everything, God loved and cared for him. In our gospel passage from Mark, Jesus, having recently assembled his disciples, having cured a few sick people, and having offered a few parables, goes on a boat ride with his disciples. You might recall the final line of the gospel passage we heard last week, that while Jesus offered his parables to everyone, he explained everything in private to his disciples. Perhaps the boat ride provided one of those opportunities to explain things. But as the disciples soon found out, Jesus often explained things less in words and more in the experiences that life throws you. While sailing on the Sea of Galilee, which is famous for its frequent and violent storms, a real doozy, that's a technical term among mariners, a real doozy brews up. As you just heard, the disciples are overwhelmed and terrified while Jesus sleeps peacefully. 
The disciples wake up Jesus, complaining about his apparent lack of concern for them. And Jesus calms the wind and the sea, asking his disciples, do you not yet have faith? Well, the answer to that is pretty clear to everyone. Yes, the disciples are still lacking in faith. In fact, we who have read the rest of the story know that their faith will remain fairly flimsy until they experience Jesus after his resurrection. The post-resurrection kind of faith is described in our second reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. It's the kind of faith that recognizes that as long as we have Christ in our life, all will be well. For whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. While Jesus is physically present to the disciples, they are still trying to figure out who he is and what he means for their lives. I wouldn't be surprised if many, if not most of us, are still in the process of figuring out who Jesus is for us. So perhaps this gospel passage tells us a lot more than to simply be careful the next time we are on a boat in a storm. It may be helpful to recognize that a storm can be a metaphor for anything that life throws your way, whether it be a personal tragedy or a pandemic. And a boat can be a metaphor for a parish or any other community of which you are a member. Today's gospel should certainly remind us that God can fix anything, solve any problem, and rescue us in times of distress. But often God chooses to help us indirectly rather than directly, which is to say God often works through you and me. Thus, we should take a closer look at those disciples in the boat to see if we might learn anything from them. First, the disciples have only known Jesus for a short time. They really are in the process of getting to know him. This should remind us, whether we are nine or ninety, that we could always benefit from spending more time with Jesus through prayer, through reading the scriptures, or by sharing our faith stories with one another. Second, the disciples are still getting to know and to trust each other. The team has only recently been assembled. They had different life experiences and skills. About four were fishermen, but there was at least one tax collector, one political activist, and we don't know much about the others. But they all had useful skills and gifts, but they needed to learn to rely upon the expertise of one another and to use their skills for the benefit of the group. In a small boat in the middle of a storm, everyone becomes a crew member. No one can be just a passenger. It's easy for me to imagine that when the storm came up, every disciple thought he was either a meteorologist or an experienced mariner, which only made things worse. Similarly, during this past year, it seemed like everyone I met had become an epidemiologist. <laughs> everyone was an, an expert on the pandemic. Good disciples recognize the gifts of one another. I'm reminded of when I worked with Father Shea several years ago. He could always count on me to collect the right data, to explain financial reports and investment strategies, and to remind him that even very thin pancakes have two sides to them. Likewise, I could count on him to keep the province focused on Jesus, to remind us of the importance to go deeper in our spiritual life, and to provide me with a weekly, if not daily, report on the exploits of Katie Ledecky. <laughs> Plus, I think we enjoyed each other's company. By now, you may have figured out 
that I think a parish is like a boat. In our parish, we need to remember that Jesus is always with us. All of us need to spend time getting to know him better. In our parish, everyone is invited to be a crew member rather than a passenger. We need to spend time with one another, and we should always be grateful to welcome new members. In our parish, everyone has gifts and talents that can be used for the benefit of all. We need to recognize and to cherish these many gifts. Let us pray that our parish will always be centered on Jesus, especially in stormy times, that we may remain faithful, not fearful, and that we can always value and count on the God-given gifts of one another. Thank you for welcoming me aboard.